In this unit, we're going to see a second application of graphical models in the context of dense multi-view stereo reconstruction, which is the problem of reconstructing a 3D scene, not from just two images, but from multiple images of that scene. And the advantage, of course, similar to in the case of sparse reconstruction that we have looked at in the beginning of this lecture is that we have more constraints and we can better resolve ambiguities. And we can also reconstruct not just a two and a half D depth representation, but really a, a complete 3D reconstruction of the scene. So here's an example of what we want to achieve. On the left is a set of input images. I show only three here, but in practice there's of course, many more. We use around 50 to 100 images for a 3D reconstruction. And we want to develop a model now that allows for inferring such a 3D volumetric representation as we can see here on the right hand side, or for inferring depth maps from that um, uh, set of Im input images that we have observed. Now, even for using many more cameras, image-based 3D reconstruction can still be a highly ill-posed problem. For example, in the context of textless areas. So here's this green area um, that has almost the same color everywhere. And if we look at that scene from multiple different viewpoints, in this case, from two different viewpoints, then, so this is a, a side view. Imagine this as a side view here. Um, where this is the ground, then the true surface is the green one here. But because all of these pixels are roughly the same color or intensity, uh, any of these other surfaces, the blue one, the red one, or the black one are also plausible surfaces. So there's still a lot of reconstruction ambiguity. And of course we can remove some of these ambiguity um, ambiguities by introducing appropriate priors, such as maybe assuming that this uh, region here is flat, but the stronger these priors are, the stronger our assumptions are, the stronger will also be, or the larger will be the mistakes that we're doing in case these assumptions are violated. And therefore, coping with and exposing uncertainty is really essential. So the question is now, can we utilize the power of probabilistic graphical models to formulate dense 3D reconstruction from multiple views in a probabilistic fashion. This is the representation that we're going to use. We're going to discretize the 3D volume that we consider into a discrete set of so-called voxels. Each of these little cubes here is a voxel. And depending on the resolution that we apply in each dimension, you have more or less voxels. So here's just a five by five by five voxel grid. But in practice, of course, we use much higher resolution voxel grids in the order of 1000 by 1000 by 1000. So we have discretized the 3D volume. Now, how do we represent the 3D geometry and appearance inside that volume? Well, for each of these voxels, each of these little cubes we're going to uh, assign with two random variables. The first random variable is the voxel occupancy. It's a binary random variable associated with each of these voxels that tells or that is equal to one if that particular voxel is occupied and that is equal to zero if the voxel is empty. And the second variable that we're going to associate with each voxel a is the voxel appearance. And that's a real number. In our case here, we are going to consider grayscale images or inference just in terms of intensity values. But we could also use r to the power of 3 in order to represent color or um, even more, more complex properties of the, of the appearance. But we are going to focus on the most simple case here, which is just a one-dimensional real number, a scalar that represents at each um, voxel how bright that voxel appears in the images 
And of course, it makes the Lambertian assumption and it's a very inaccurate representation, but it's the most simple representation that we can start with. And we're also going to introduce a little shorthand notation that helps us uh, formulating the problem later on. So here's a camera. This in symbol indicates a camera. And on the image plane of the camera, there's many pixels. Now we know already that the combination of the camera center and the particular pixel defines a ray that passes through 3D space by projective geometry as discussed in lecture number two. So we can talk about rays or pixels interchangeably. And when I talk about pixels or rays, that effectively means the same. For a particular camera and a particular pixel that corresponds to a particular ray. And one particular ray is illustrated here. And what we're going to do with this shorthand notation, bold face O and bold face A with index R. Later on, we're going to omit that index for simplicity, but for each of these rays, each of the cameras has a set of pixels and each of these pixel corresponds to rays. So from all of the cameras uh, together, we have uh, many more rays than we have from a single camera. And we consider just a generic ray here. There could be any of these rays from any of the cameras corresponding to any of the pixels. So for each of these rays, we have this boldface O and boldface A variable, which simply um, uh, collect a set of random variables from the entire volume that are intersected by that ray. And they collect it in the order that they are intersected with when starting from the camera center. So in this case here, we have two random variables, O1 and A1, um, associated with the first voxel that's intersected by the ray. And then we have two variables associated with the second voxel and so on. And that's how we define O, R and A, R. In the order, the ray intersects the voxels. In this case, N, R, which is the number of voxels that are intersected by ray R is five. Now, in order to solve an ill-posed computer vision problem such as multi-view of 3D reconstruction, we first have to understand the image formation process. And that's illustrated here. I'm often using color to better illustrate, but really what we do in, in the end to consider only is uh, the intensity. But think of color and intensity as being the same. So how does image formation work? Well. Intuitively, that's not very hard to answer for solid objects. The color of a particular pixel corresponding to a particular ray in a particular camera is simply, well, the first the color of the first occupied voxel that is hit by that ray. So if we go from the camera center along that ray through that 3D volume, the first two voxels here are empty space, free space, but this third voxel here is occupied and has the color or intensity red, then this color should appear on that pixel because that's the first occupied voxel's color. Now, how can we formulate this mathematically? Well, let IR denote intensity or color at the pixel R. And OI and AI be defined as before, these occupancy and appearance variables sorted along that ray where they are intersected by the ray. Then the intensity at the pixel R is simply this expression here. Now this looks a little bit complicated at first glance, but it's really easy to understand. What we have here, this term here, is simply telling us, well, or this term here is simply equal to one if I is the first occupied, oh, I is the first occupied voxel. And why is that true? Well, only if OI is the first occupied voxel, then this term is one, and this term is zero, so the entire product here is also one, and the product of one and one is one. So only in the case of OI being the first occupied voxel, this expression is one. And in all other cases, this expression will be zero because there are, well, either OI might not be occupied or any of the previous voxels might be occupied. So this expression is exactly one if OI is the first occupied voxel. And now, of course, if OI is the first occupied voxel, then we want to take the color of that voxel. So we multiply a one with that uh, 
color or intensity value and copy it to the pixel. And because we don't know which of these voxels along the ray, which of these n5 in this case voxels along the ray is the first occupied voxel, we need to sum over all possible hypotheses. But only one of these term, in only in one of these terms, this expression here will be equal to one. In all other ones, um, oi will not be the first occupied voxel, so the color will not um, be or the color of that voxel will not be taken into account by this expression because this term here is one only if oi is the first occupied voxel. So now we have a simple formula that represents exactly the fact that the pixel should, the pixel intensity or color should correspond to the intensity or color of the first occupied voxel. Okay. Now, as mentioned before, we want to formulate a probabilistic model and want to do inference in a probabilistic model in order to expose uncertainty. So given the knowledge of the image formation process, we now define a probability distribution over all the occupancy variables and all the appearance variables in this volume. So it's a very large number of occupancy and appearance variables. And we denote this by capital O and capital A. And we are factorizing this distribution over all occupancy and appearance variables into a product of unaries and so-called ray factors. And now these ray factors are higher order potentials. They are not like in the stereo example pairwise factors, but they are really higher order potentials because they connect all the variables along the ray, all the O's and R's along the uh, A's along the ray, which could be hundreds of variables. And so we need to find an efficient um, way, uh, tractable way of actually doing inference in this model because we have such high order factors in that model. Now, what are these factors? Well, the unary potentials are just some simple prior knowledge that we can specify about general occupancy of the occupancy variables or the general occupancy of the, field of the scene. So this is a simple Bernoulli independent per site Bernoulli distribution where we have a hyperparameter gamma um, that controls how much we believe voxels in a scene are empty or not empty. And as most voxels in a scene are empty, typically gamma is uh, small, chosen smaller than 0 0.5. And it helps a little bit in cleaning up some of the outliers that are inferred by this model. So it's a useful term to have. But the really important term here is of course this ray potential that models the consistency of the 3D reconstruction that we want to infer and all the images, all the observations. And as already mentioned, this factor or potential here is a higher order one because it's connected to all the occupancy and all the appearance variables along the ray, um, all the voxels that are intersected by the ray. And how do we choose that? Well, we're going to take advantage of our image formation model. This is exactly the same expression as before, except that we have replaced AI here with the Gaussian centered at IR and the Gaussian of AI, because we can't assume that the intensity um, of a particular voxel is observed exactly the same way in all the images because of noise and because our simplistic uh, assumptions here don't hold true. Even in the Lambertian case, it would actually not hold true. And uh, so we are allowing for a little bit of slack. So um, we are allowing for A and I to deviate a little bit. And this is a hyperparameter that we can tune with this sigma parameter of this Gaussian distribution. So there's a little bit of noise uh, uh, allowed by adding this noise term here. But still, if you think about this term, um, a configuration of O's and A's that maximizes the joint distribution, the probability, is one where for all of the rays in all of the cameras, so this is the ray set that goes over all of the rays of all of the cameras, is um, increasing the value of this potential. And that is exactly increased if um, uh, the first occupied voxel, 
is similar to the pixel that is corresponding to that ray. If A is similar to I, then this term will be large. And if it's the first occupied voxel, then this will be one. So we are getting a large value here in this potential. So we not only have a constraint from a single image, of course, which would be completely ambiguous, but now we have these constraints from all the images. And this illustrates again that only if we have the constraints from all the images, then we can, on one hand, infer a complete 3 d reconstruction, but also um, reduce the uncertainty um, because we have neighboring many neighboring views that uh, see the same surface, and this leads to better surface reconstructions. So we want to infer a 3D reconstruction here that is consistent with all of the images that have been taken from that scene. This is the model. Now, how can we do probabilistic inference in that model? We're going to use the sum product algorithm. And the simplest thing we can do in terms of an inference question is to ask, well, for each of the input views or any novel view, any ray actually, in the scene, what is the depth along that ray? If we can answer that question, then we can, well, we can reconstruct depth maps, but we can, if we can get the depth along each potential ray in the scene, then we can, we have the reconstruction. We can also extract the mesh, etc. So this is a question, one of the simplest questions we can ask. What is the, along any ray in the scene, can be a ray from the cameras that have observed the scene, but can be also any arbitrary ray. What is the distance to the first occupied voxel along that ray? That's what we're going to consider here. So consider a single ray R in space as illustrated here. Let now dk be the Euclidean distance from the camera center or the origin of that ray to the voxel k along that ray. Okay, That's the case if we want to infer depth maps. right? We want to get the metric distance. So for instance, voxel 1 is at 3 meters distance, voxel 2 is at 3.5 meters distance, etc. That's just the definition. And let then the depth d along that ray be the distance to the closest occupied voxel. So d takes, of course, a value from the set of these dk's. So d is either d1, d2. In this case, d is equal to d3 because this is the first occupied voxel. Now what we want to obtain is, of course, the best possible depth estimate, the optimal depth estimate. And if you're familiar with um, uh, Bayesian inference um, and risk minimization, um, uh, and if you're familiar with the base risk, then you know that, well, the optimal depth is the one that minimizes some form of risk. But what is risk in our, in our setting? So we want to find the D prime that's minimizing the risk over all potential depth values. Well, the risk is simply the expected loss over the depth distribution. So we want to find the d prime that's minimizing some loss um, uh, with res um, in expectation with respect to the distribution of depth values along the ray. And depending on how we choose that loss, if we choose it as a, a squared loss, for instance, then um, this corresponds to the mean over the depth values along the ray. If we choose L1 loss, this corresponds to the median. This is easy to see if you plug in these expressions in here. Um, you can see that um, this corresponds to the mean or the median. Now, this is good. Um, but of course, this hasn't solved our problem yet because uh, it only demonstrates what we need. Right? This is an ex expression that's easy to evaluate, but we need first to compute the marginal depth distribution P of D along each ray. And that's the inference quantity that we are looking after. So we're looking after a marginal, and we know that marginals can be computed using the sum product algorithm. So we're going to use the sum product algorithm or some form of the sum product algorithm here. Okay. So, um, but this is because of the higher order nature of these potentials, uh, a difficult problem. And so we first have to simplify it. And it turns out that um, due to the special setting here, the equations simplify quite a bit. And I want to show you some of these simplifications, not all of them, some of them um, you will find in, in, in the paper. So let's assume now 
let's consider again the depth distribution for a single ray and assume that we have this particular configuration. But we assume this without loss of generality. So it could be any of the voxels could be the first occupied voxel. But we here we assume that the cave voxel is the first occupied voxel. But the consideration that we're doing here holds for all k's being the first occupied voxels. If this holds true, then the probability of d being equal to dk is of course the probability of this constellation because we have assumed ok is the first occupied voxel, where, well, d takes dk corresponds to ok. Now, this expression here is a marginal distribution with respect to all the distribution over all the voxels and appearance variables along the ray, right? Because this is a distribution over only the first k occupancy variables, and it doesn't even consider the appearance variables. So we can write this in terms of a marginal distribution where we sum over all the O's that are larger than, with an index larger than k, and all of the appearance variables. And because the appearance variables are real numbers, we here we have to integrate. Now, here we have again a marginal distribution because this is the distribution of all the occupancy and appearance variables along the ray, and that's a marginal with respect to the joint of all the occupancy and appearance variables in the volume, which are many more. Here we only consider the ones that intersect the ray. So how can we compute a marginal distribution? Well, we can use the sum product algorithm. And then the marginal after running the algorithm is given as the product of the factor and the incoming messages. That's what we have derived in the previous lecture. So in this case of a factor of this uh, ray factor, this high order factor, we have the product of the factor itself with all the messages that are coming in from the A, the appearance variables along the ray, and all the messages that are coming in from the occupancy variable variables along the ray. Okay. Now this is a very nasty expression to calculate, of course, because we have a summation of a very large state space and also an integration of a very large state space. This bold A is, is maybe 300 dimensional because it comprises all the variables along the ray. But luckily things simplify. The first thing that we can observe is that this expression here, because OK is the first occupied voxel, simplifies to just the Gaussian of AK given I. Right, because we know that this exp this term here is one exactly um, for i equals k, only the cave term here plays a role, and we can plug that in. But again, this consideration that we're doing here holds for all the k's. Okay, so we have simplified this. Now what we can do also is we can pull out all the products, all the messages where the of all the occupancy variables with i smaller or equal to k so that just the ones with i bigger than k remain here corresponding to the values that we sum over and similarly we can pull out the ak all the terms that depend on ak there is one here one product and this term so we have pulled out this integral over ak such that only the integral over a not equal k remains. Now, why did we do that? Well, if we look closely at this expression and if we assume that these messages are normalized, which we can do, these are very simple distributions, um, then we see that, well, because we sum and integrate over exactly the entire state space here that is still left inside, here, this is over OK, uh, uh, o um, bigger than k and here we have all the elements that are bigger than k and here we have all the a's with i not equal to k which is exactly what we integrate over. So if we sum and integrate over the entire state space of a normalized distribution then of course um, this is equal to 1. Right? If I integrate over Gaussian distribution then the integral is 1. So we're left with this expression and we see now that 
This expression is much simpler than before. It, it doesn't require summation over very large state spaces, but it just requires an integral over a one-dimensional variable now and a product over several of these terms. But it, it doesn't have this exponential complexity from before. And the intuition of this term that we have derived is also very simple. The depth d is equal to dk exactly if voxel k is occupied and visible. This is the first term. Remember again that this is what we have considered. In this case, this is corresponding to voxel k is occupied and visible. And the second, the blue term, simply says that it should explain the observed pixel value, right? So for that first occupied voxel, a k should be close to i because then this um, probability here is large. And the question, of course, is, well, how can we obtain mu and this mu of O and this mu of AK, which are the messages, the incoming messages? Um, if we go back here, these are the incoming messages, right? And we obtain them using some, pro some product belief propagation message passing. So here's an illustration of how we pass the messages. We have these cameras that are intersecting voxels in this volume, and then we pass messages from the rays to the factors and from the factors to the rays. And we iterate until convergence. Now, some of these messages, like um, these uh, messages from the unary potentials to the occupancies are very simple. And the variable to factor messages are also simple because they are just a product. But some of these messages are hard to compute, in particular the ones that go from this higher order potential back to the variables. However, using similar simplifications as we have seen on previous slide, this can also be simplified. The exponential complexity of this higher order factor also reduces to a linear time complexity. But the the derivation of this is a little bit technical, and so I omitted it for the sake of this lecture. If you're interested in this, there is a very um, detailed and rigorous uh, mathematical formulation that can be found in the supplementary of the paper listed below. So to summarize, what are the challenges and what are the solutions if we want to apply um, belief propagation to the problem of multiview stereo? Well, the challenge, the first challenge is that the MRF comprises discrete and continuous variables. So it's not just a discrete problem, but we also need to reason in this joint discrete and continuous space. The second challenge is that the ray potentials are higher order and so lead to this exponential complexity at first glance. And there are many factors. Uh, each pixel defines a factor. So it's a very, it requires a lot of computation to be solved. Now the solution um, to this uh, is that uh, the um, well the continue the, the this continuous problem we can tackle by approximating the messages using continuous belief propagation where we keep um, uh, distributions in terms of mixture of Gaussians and update them via importance sampling. So this is something that I haven't shown, but it's something that you also find in the paper. And then the uh, messages can actually be calculated in linear time, as I already mentioned. And there is an exact derivation of these messages, but it's quite technical. And then to address the third point, um, what has been done in this paper is an octree coarse to fine representation and heavy GP GPU parallelization in order to um, execute that algorithm. So it's running on a GPU with an efficient data structure in order to um, result in meaningful, uh, uh, return meaningful results in reasonable time. Okay, so let's look at some results. Here is a data set that has been considered in this work. It's a data set from Restrepo et al. that uh, has been captured by flying around a city uh, providence and uh, capturing images of that city and uh, at the same time um, 
there was a lidar that was measuring depth so that the that accurate ground truth depth or relatively accurate ground truth depth was available for evaluation. So this is what you can see here. At the bottom is the ground truth depth. And so this algorithm compared to previous algorithms, uh, local algorithms, but also global algorithms that were not exposing uncertainty improves performance in particular in textless areas, which you can see by this gap in the curves. But what is maybe more interesting is to look at some qualitative results. So here's a particular patch of a particular input image. And for the patch, of course, with this algorithm that I've just shown, we can infer a depth map. And so here's the depth map that has been inferred by a previous algorithm that was using maximum a posteriori inference and that wasn't exposing the uncertainty. And this is the error map. So the error map is a colored visualization of where errors are large and where errors are small. Blue means small errors, red means large errors. And these red regions here typically correspond to textless areas. And so in these areas, the space optimal prediction is uh, better. It produces less error. And here's a video of the results. You can see on the left a rendering of the appearance and on the right a rendering of the occupancy. And what you can see here is that depending on the building there is um, a, a good reconstruction possible or not. So here's a building with a lot of texture. It's easy to reconstruct. So we have um, um, uh, we have a uh, high uh, certainty also for these uh, voxels to be occupied. But here there is a building with a mirror-like facade where the appearance model completely breaks down. And while this algorithm is not able to reconstruct that, at least it knows that it's not able to reconstruct that because it exposes the uncertainty, um, which is illustrated here by this white area. Now, similar to the case with 2D stereo matching, uh, with um, two view stereo matching, where we have also integrated higher order constraints in terms of objects, here we can also utilize such shape prior knowledge. And so in, in this extension here of this paper, this has been done because for many scenes like this downtown scene, there is exclusive prior knowledge available. For example, if you know the GPS tag of, uh, or the rough location of where the images have been taken, you can simply query that in, in 3D warehouse and you obtain 3D models for that scene. And that's what has been obtained for that particular scene here. So you can see there's rough building outlines available for this scene. And for indoor scenes, for example, many rooms contain particular type of furniture like IKEA furniture. And so for this type of furniture, there's also a lot of CAD models available online that can be used as prior knowledge. However, there's a lot of challenges also involved. First of all, uh, these 3D models often only contain, uh, are only a coarse, uh, are only coarse, coarse and inaccurate. Um, you don't really know the orientation and also the location. So this has to be inferred as well. And there might be occlusions or the retrieved models might actually not be present in the scene and the object size is not correct. So these things have to be taken into account. And so there in, in this model, this has been done by using, a, as you can see here, a particle based representation, a sample based representation of the 3D objects. So each object is represented by a particle set and the spread of that particle set that has been inferred determines the uncertainty also of this, uh, of, of, the, of the pose of these objects. And so I wanna show you these results here. So these are the, the shape models that have been used for joint inference of geometry appearance and the shape models. And the algorithm also identifies which of these objects are very unlikely to be present and removes them. It's of course a very hard problem. There's some pre-processing steps involved, but then once you have a reasonable initialization, um, then you can get results like this, where you have now inferred not only the appearance and the geometry, but also 
the the type and pose and geometry of these objects in the scene. And what you can see here, for example, for this particular building that we have seen before, where there's a lot of ambiguities due to this mirror facade, um, that this building can be reconstructed uh, a little bit better, at least with this, with this method. So here we see the rendered uh, depth maps. To summarize, probabilistic multi-view reconstruction, um, at least this particular model here, um, on the positive side, probabilistic formulation using graphical models is tractable as these ray factors decompose and we don't have this exponential complexity. And the non-local constraints via uh, joint inference uh, uh, um, can be, uh, non-local constraints can be integrated via joint inference in 2D and 3D. This is something I haven't shown here, but there has been another related work that has shown that you can also integrate things like local planarity assumptions. We have seen that uh, also cat priors can be integrated and help to disambiguate textualist regions and using arc trees reconstructions up to 1024 to the power of three voxels, which is a really large number of voxels are possible. So that's quite exciting. However, using this loopy, highly loopy, higher order MRF, only approximate inference is possible. And it's also relatively slow. It takes several minutes per scene on a GPU. And the appearance term is very simplistic and not robust. It doesn't take into account non lambertian appearance and noise and outliers. And also the resolution is quite limited by discrete, by the discrete voxel representation that we're using here. And in the course, in the later course of this lecture, we're gonna see some, some other neural network based uh, implicit representations that tackle this or address this problem and are not restricted by the voxel discretization.